Hafadi Todu Hamzu. So we're starting this uh, virtual informational briefing a little bit late due to uh, the not uncommon issue of technical difficulties uh, with internet stability. Thank you all for your participation in today's virtual informational briefing. This virtual public hearing is convened by the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatnya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs. For the record, in accordance with the open government law, public hearing notices were given to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets, with the first notice being issued on Wednesday, October 14th, 2020, and the second notice on Monday, October 19th, 2020. The public notice for today's virtual public hearing was also posted on the legislature's website at www.guamlegislature.org. The time is now 2.21. The virtual public hearing is now called to order. To Jus Maasi for your virtual attendance to this afternoon's virtual hearing. Today's virtual informational briefing is to hear and discuss the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency's implementation of the CARES Act program and funding. Also for discussion is CAHA's leveraging of technology towards managing its grants programs and its systemic use to receive new grant applications and the processes involved. So uh, with me today, um, we will get to the introductions of those from CAHA, and I thank them very much for having such broad attendance. We have the director, uh, Ms. Gillette Leon Guerrero. We have the pro uh, program coordinator, Ms. Jackie Balbus. And we are also very fortunate to have one of the board members, uh, Ms. Patty Kreis. So, with that, let's go over the general rules for the virtual informational briefing. So once again, thank you so much for joining me. Before we open the discussions from participants of this virtual public hearing, following the agenda that was made available at the virtual link posted within the committee's communications that were provided to confirmed hearing participants, I'd first like to provide some general rules of conduct for all, for all of those who are participating and in attendance. The conduct of this virtual public hearing shall be as follows. All participants must abide by rules of conduct and quality assurance standards, including broadcasting from a quiet room with little to no interruptions. The use of virtual backgrounds is not permitted. Broadcasting from a room with adequate lighting, specifically to ensure that a participant's face is not backlit, but visible at all times when speaking. Please ensure that you are unmuted and that you are speaking clearly into your microphone after you have been called upon by the chair to speak. The chair will recognize individuals who have been confirmed as participants. Individuals providing oral testimony shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name and title for record keeping purposes. The order of questioning will be real easy today because uh, we are a panel of one. <laughs> and so uh, the panel will ask questions and they will continue until they complete their line of questioning. Oral testimony shall be confined to the substance of the issues on the agenda and the personal inference as to the character of a senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violation of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the virtual public hearing by the host. And uh, normally we ask that participants keep their comments or testimony to within five minutes but we are not applying that rule today as we want to hear a lot of good information about the good work of CAHA today. 
The virtual informational briefing follows the agenda made available through the emailed virtual public hearing notices and notification of participation sent to everyone in attendance. We will now begin this virtual informational briefing. The Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency is Guam's official state arts agency whose mission is to encourage, promote, and create opportunities for our local artisans and support our community's artistic and humanities practices and expressions. CAHA received federal funds through the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, otherwise known as the CARES Act, which are intended to help save jobs in the arts and humanities sectors and keep the doors open to organizations that add value to the quality of life of our community, as well as add to our community as cultural and other entrepreneurs. CAHA through CARES Act funding has launched a grant program that is open to eligible nonprofit organizations and individuals who were impacted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. CAHA CARES Act Emergency Relief Funds grants are for individuals that provide support for traditional and contemporary Guam artists and uh, those offering humanitary, uh, humanities materials. For those individuals who are experiencing financial hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The grant also supports individual Guam artists and NGOs, including working artists, those offering humanities materials, musicians, filmmakers, teaching artists, production personnel, and art-based contract workers. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed unprecedented strain on the arts and cultural and humanities community. Artists and contract workers engaged in producing art and art artistic, excuse me, and cultural events uh, or providing hu humanities materials or events in particular are facing an unprecedented loss of income due to the widespread cancellation of events and activities. This grant program is open to eligible nonprofit organizations and individuals who, as we mentioned, were impacted or had programming interrupted or canceled due to COVID-19 pandemic. Also for discussion will be CAHA's leveraging of technological tools to administer and manage its funding and its program duties. This I'm very excited about because overall, but especially during this time of social distancing and needing safety protocols, we are encouraging all agencies to update their technology make themselves more uh, available um, through either online access, but at the, at the very least to be updating their technology so that they are making their office and their procedures and thus the services for the community more streamlined and efficient. After all that, I now call upon uh, the director, Gillette Leon Guerrero to open discussions and provide information on CAHA's work and accomplishments in using CARES Act funds and leveraging technology to CAHA's benefit and the community's benefit as well. Director Leon Guerrero, please proceed. Uh, if you could unmute yourself and then begin with your, your name and then you may begin your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator. Um, my name is Gillette Leon Guerrero and I'm the executive director of uh, CAHA. Um, I'm really happy to be here and have the opportunity to talk about our CARES Act uh, grant program and our efforts to utilize technology in order to become a more efficient, productive and cost effective agency. I'd like to speak to these um, topics separately, uh, starting with the CAHA CARES Act emergency grant funding program. But before I start, I wanna recognize and thank Humanities Guahan for the invaluable assistance that they provided in helping us to get our CARES Act grant program up and running. They did all of the hard work in researching and laying the fr framework for the program uh, so that we were able to uh, adapt it 
uh, for CAHA. This saved us a lot of time and enabled us to get our program up and running quickly. Uh, Humanities Guahan and CAHA have a long history of working together and we consider them our sister organization and we look forward to continuing our collaboration with them. And I also need to also acknowledge the National Endowment for the Arts for providing this grant opportunity. And this funding was provided because the federal government recognizes the role the arts and humanities and cultural organizations play in not only our society, but in the economy of the nation not just the island, the nation. <laughs> so, so let me, if you give me one minute and I was, I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, I should have done this before. Uh, share screen, share, and then I need to do my slideshow. Sorry. Uh, slideshow. It's not, of course, I did this in practice and it went really smoothly. <laughs> Play slideshow. Where is it? There we go. Okay. Can you all see it? Okay. Um, well, our CARES Act um, was launched on uh, October 2nd. And uh, as the senator had said, it, it provides emergency le relief grants for nonprofits and individuals impacted by COVID-19. And there are three grant lines uh, that um, applicants can apply to. And uh, we have one for arts and humanities and or cultural based nonprofit organizations. We have one for other nonprofits that actually have um, arts or humanities or cultural programming planned that was interrupted, canceled or postponed due to the pandemic. And then the third one is uh, individual artists that uh, have um, impacted. Each one of these has um, uh, different requirements. And I thought that what would be good to do would be to go to the, uh, sorry, go to the um, website and show you how easy it, it, it is. This is very sensitive. Okay, there we go. So this is the, this is the, the Kaha website that's going to be upgraded. It's not upgraded yet. It's being worked on. So uh, if you go to our homepage, you see this here and um, you just need to click on this button, read more and apply online. That will take you here. This is uh, an area where you find all of the um, information about eligibility for each of the uh, different grant lines because each one has different, a little different uh, requirements. So we encourage the applicants to really look at this information well. And it's not that hard. I mean, if um, it, it's a pretty, pretty simple process. And at the bottom here, we put a table uh, that shows the difference between the different uh, uh, grant lines and the documents that are required for each each uh, grant line. So it's it's pretty simple. So um, then what they need to do is click here to apply online, and this will take them to another page. Okay, this page has all three of the grant lines. So they just need to select which one they would like to apply under. Um, we have had some applicants that applied under one and they, uh, they turned it in and we said, no, you need to apply under uh, a different grant line because you don't qualify for this one. So they have done that. So if they click apply here, this will take them to this particular grant line. This is the arts and um, cultural nonprofit organizations. So at the top of the page, you have all of the um, directions, you know, sort of how, how to go about it, who's eligible, you know. Um, again, you have all of that information. We really want you to know if you're eligible or not. And if you're new to this, you need to create an account. Uh, so basically, it's clicking here, entering your um, uh, email address, and it, you'll get it right away. Uh, I, I don't want to do it now because I already have a, an account that I set up just for this. Um, so I'm going to sign in. So this brings you to this page. So, oh shoot, what was my, <laughs> what did I set it up as? I think it was, oh yes. Um, and I need that again. Okay, please be correct. Yes, <laughs> I just set this up for, for this demonstration. So this brings you to the actual application. Um, 
And uh, again, you have the same information who's eligible. And then you start, you have the questions here. Now, there are some people that are not techni technologically um, savvy, I guess you might say. So on this page, if you look up here on the right hand corner, it has a section here, uh, a link that you can go to that says invite collaborators. So you can actually click on this and invite someone, uh, another person in your organization, you know, someone, you know, a, a friend or someone that you know that has the, the skills, you know, tech, uh, uh, computer skills to help you and they can help you. We also use this for there. There are some uh, older people, um, some of our masters, I think, uh, um, that uh, don't even have a computer. So they actually, I, we told them to invite one of our program off, uh, coordinators to help them. So they actually uh, completed the application over, over the telephone. Um, uh, they were able to get all of the information um, that way. So. So people are not left out. I just wanna mention that. So then um, you get down here and uh, it asks you a question. So for this particular um, grant, you, you have to be an organization. You have to be a nonprofit organization. So if you say yes here, it opens up all of the other questions down here and you can proceed. But if you say no, it's, it gives you a message that says, sorry, you are not eligible for this grant funding. So you just stop right there. So you just say yes, and then you just proceed down with all of the um, information that you have. Okay, there are, um, and then you come to another, uh, here's another question, number nine, it stops here. Are you a cultural organization or arts-based organization? And if you say yes, then uh, it will populate more questions. But if you say no, again, you'll be uh, told that you're not eligible for this particular grant line. Um, so let's just say yes. So you're gonna be asked information about your team, your contact. Uh, you have to have a fiscal officer for the organizations. Um, as well as uh, you need at least two people from your organization to apply um, that need to sign it, a primary contact and the um, fiscal officer. So there's a, a lot of questions. And then there's the opportunity to upload uh, information. Uh, the documents that were listed in the table on the beginning section, um, you can upload them here. And in some cases, let me see if I have one here. In some cases, there are documents, I think it's more in the individual section, where we actually put links so that if they uh, are not, if they don't have that document, they can actually apply for it online. Yeah, no, that, that's more for the end. And basically at the bottom, you just click apply. And that's it. That's how simple it is. <laughs> and let me show you. I'll just go back if, uh, to show you the section um, for individuals where um, just so I can show you a, a sample. Uh, I think it's the W-9 that is required. A lot of people don't have that form. So we actually put a link in here. Oh, are you a US citizen or permanent resident? Say yes. So then so here you have to upload, upload a proof of Guam residency and down here it gives you directions of what we accept for that. Um, um, here's, the, here's the please upload your completed form W-9. And down here you see a little link. It says form W-9 available here. You just click on that and you can fill it out right there. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for everyone. So I think that's, that's, uh, I think that is it for the quick demonstration. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just go back to here. So now, now let's get to the, the, um, the grant review process. So after the application is submitted, it undergoes an initial review to ensure the eligibility of the applicant and the completeness of the submission. 
the applicant will be contacted if additional information is requested or required. And we've, most of the applications we've had to do this because sometimes they submit the wrong document or something is not clear or their budget doesn't balance. So there's a, a function in the, the, the platform that you can actually email them and when they send it back, it co goes right into the system. So you don't have any problem with losing paper or, you know, <laughs> you know, not finding things. Everything is there connected to the, the particular application. Um, and then after it passes that initial um, review, it goes on to a secondary review, uh, which also verifies the, uh, the completeness and eligibility. And then it also, we also ensure the clarity of the descriptive text in the application. And uh, we might have some questions that we feel that need to be verified. So we'll go back and ask them again the second time. So after the secondary review, then it goes to the final review, which is uh, the board of directors who make the final determination. Um, it's it's um, sc score based, everyone scores it. So as it passes through, and at any of these levels, it can be rejected or turned back, but um, if something is, is found that's not, you know, it's not appropriate or it doesn't meet the, the guidelines. Then after that, after the approval, um, a grant agreement is drawn up and signed by the applicant, the chairman of the board, the executive director and the certifying officer. Now I, I need to do some research uh, about um, uh, digital um, signatures. So I think that uh, I, I, I haven't uh, done that yet. I need to check with the AG if, if digital signatures are okay for the applicant, but I, I, I tend to think that we might need a, a written signature. So we will have to make arrangements for that. And then also to get the chairman of the board and myself uh, and the certifying officer's signatures. And then after that process, it is routed through the government process. I was hoping to avoid this, but this is how it, I was told that we can't. So it uh, first goes to BBMR, then to the general, the attorney general's office for review, then signature by the governor, and then to the Department of Administration uh, who prepares and mails the check. So it's not a simple um, process uh, that I was hoping it was going to be, <laughs> but um, that's it. So um, to date, we have received 19 grant applications. Um, oh shoot, I, sorry, I have a, uh, I think maybe about um, two or three, three of them are nonprofits and the rest are individuals. Um, the applications that we have so far total about, I haven't checked today, about $100,000 and we have $114,600 in the budget. Uh, these grants are in various stages of review and while not all of the applications will be funded because I think that there are some problems with some of them, um, uh, we are getting close to our grant budget of, I mean, we could get close to our grant uh, ceiling of 114,600. So we are encouraging um, eligible nonprofit organizations and individuals to apply as soon as possible so that uh, we can get the funds to where they're needed. So don't delay. <laughs> So that is my uh, presentation on the CARES Act. Do you want to take questions or you want me to go on to the technology part? Well, I'd like to go ahead and ask questions. Um, I really appreciate the demonstration, especially getting to go to the website, mm -hmm. because again, that is something that we're um, really encouraging the agencies to do is make forms, applications, uh, questions, uh, you know, those kind of processes available online so that people can access them that way and it doesn't matter or it matters uh, less and provides more flexibility if offices are physically open and those sort of things. And for a lot of us, um, although there, there are definitely ups and downs with, um, with this pandemic, um, there, at least for, for going to meetings and and uh, to government offices, there can be less time if they are set up like this because you can just go online rather than taking 20 minutes or 50 minutes to, to drive there. 
yeah. and yeah. so forth. So I do appreciate that. And I really liked some of the features that you mentioned that it's already built in so that if you have a question for somebody, you mm -hmm. can just email them right away. It, it doesn't become a multi-step right. process. Right. And so it, it seems like it's very efficient in the way that it's set up. So when you were mentioning the CARES Act funding, so you were saying, if I understood you correctly, that there's 114,000 available for the funds mm -hmm. that people are applying for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, and yes, then yes. was there any other additional CARES Act funding that helped you as an agency deal with a lot of these issues um, and, and help make you more COVID-19, I guess, yeah. resistant or flexible? Well, yes, there was, there, we, we were allotted uh, $50,000, but it was very restricted uh, to uh, rent or uh, salaries. So we applied it towards rent because we were expecting, you know, to, um, to move into a new place. Okay, and, and that'll be, yeah, that'll be something that I, I ask about a little bit later because, um, I, you know, we as a community, I mean, we are getting these safety protocols in place and we're learning how to be able to open up with these safety protocols. So I know when things get into place, we will be looking forward to maybe, even if it's not physical exhibits at first, Mm -hmm. um, you and I have both seen that there are virtual art exhibits. And so there are ways to still provide some of these roles that you were mentioning for society mm -hmm. to lift people up, to help them aspire, uh, to help inspire them uh, and things like this or for humanities while well, it even art uh, to get them to think through issues. So, uh, but we'll, we'll, save that for later. Um, I'll focus more on the CARES Act funding for now. And just so that we understand the process, was this CARES Act funding, because it was identified and it did come through the National Endowment for the Arts, mm -hmm. did this come to CAHA directly, so to speak, or was it sent to the governor who then transmitted it to CAHA? It came directly to CAHA. It okay. came to directly to CAHA as part of our grant. Oh, I see. Very good. Okay. And um, yeah, I just think for people, it helps them understand all these processes because there is money that comes specifically to the governor and, um, you know, it's, it's her discretion, how it is used, or some of it is, is sent to her for specific purposes, like let's say education. But again, uh, there may be a two-step process, but for this one, uh, again, the nation understands the role that arts and the humanities plays, and so they sent it to you directly. Very good. And I really like that you also said that was something very new to me for these online grant applications where we could actually invite in collaborators. Mm -hmm. So um, it sounds like in the way that you described it, it could be uh, somebody who's at home and they could invite somebody online? Is it online? They yes, could online. invite them from their home or their office and they could work on it together? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. So that's that's really um, a leap yes. from, from the other types of applications that I've seen over the years. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. Um, always in the, having one more eye yes. on a grant application can always be helpful. So I really appreciate that. Now, I know also that for a lot of people, um, there may be some hesitation or worry about filling out a grant application properly. And again, it was good to hear that there are these first and second level reviews where there can be emailing or maybe even uh, calling mm -hmm. to work with the applicant to help walk them through the process. Um, so I really like that part because, you know, with uh, other grant application processes over the years, um, you just, if, it, if the documentation's not there, it just uh, doesn't get processed at all. And so I really like that we're here to help the community 
because I mean, that's our intention all along is to help them. And so that if there's something missing or that was misunderstood, uh, you can reach out to them and, and walk them through that. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Um, so it seems like we're very near the meeting the threshold. Is there a grant end date um, so that for that last 10 or 14 or $4,000 that's out there, is there an end date or is it until um, people have enough people in MPOs have applied and, and it's used up? No, um, it's, it's, unlike, it's unlike a lot of the other CARES Act date, uh, I, think, um, I think they have to use their money by December 31st of 2020. No, this, they, uh, NEA actually extended our grant for two years. So, um, and I, I double checked with uh, NEA just, uh, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, and uh, our CARES Act actually does, uh, follows our regular grant. So we have plenty of time to um, award the money and then also to, um, to, to, to for the um, applicants to, to carry out whatever projects, you know, that they're going to do. Excellent, so, yeah, well that's good to hear. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, a, a, grant, a grant deadline, um, especially if it's very short, it would just be a, a couple of months between now and the end of the year. So it's really good to hear that they've provided that flexibility. And um, with that, are there limits to how much people have been able to apply for or is it dependent upon their vision that they're proposing? Well, each, each applicant has to supply a, um, a budget and tell us how they're going to use the money. It has to be justified. But the uh, nonprofit organizations, the limit, uh, the ceiling is $10,000 and the individual limit is $5,000. Yeah, and, and I can see that there's value in that because that way you can spread it out a little bit more broadly. Mm -hmm. So that there are many artists that can participate, as you mentioned, I think about 16 have applied already and, um, and three MPOs. And so that way you can meet uh, more mm -hmm. in the community with uh, some other needs or programs. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess it's probably a bit too early, like uh, we can't divulge any of the uh, possible programs yet. So <laughs> no, I won't ask, but I, I'm sure I'm looking forward to them. Um, and so for the timeline, okay, you said that they will have uh, two years, which I think right now flexibility is a good thing. Uh, we really don't know <laughs> absolutely what's around the corner for any of us. So it's good to hear that there's that flexibility. And for these um, end products or these, these proposals, do they all have an, uh, an end product or can some of them be about research and just processes uh, or outreach, those kind of things? Yeah, I, I, I think it depends. Jackie, if you wanna pipe up on this, this area, I'd, I think we would like them to have, product, um, to have some kind of a product, but I don't think that it's required. Jackie, can you? That's correct, um, Gillette, it's not required. Um, as you said, it, it, it would be nice to have a tangible product, but, you know, uh, the main goal of the, this program is to uh, give relief and to help these artists and organizations that are struggling to complete programs that they had planned for 2020. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and I do know, I mean, I, I do know that there are programs out there and some of the ways that they reach out to the youth, the kids, is through art. It's a very powerful tool. Um, so I can see that probably several of them did have programs that were going to reach out to our community or our youth that way, and that got interrupted. So, um, and with the reporting, so when the project ends, there will be maybe like a, a one or so page report. Um, is there like a format for this, a form? Uh, Jackie? Uh, yes, there will be a, a final project report form um, developed that will you know, ask them to uh, tell us what the monies were used for, 
and to explain what the outcome of the project was. And they would also have to provide receipts for uh, expenses, uh, the money is what they were used for. Similar to our, our regular grant process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is where we're really fortunate as a community, I feel, because I know Jackie has been with Kaha for, I think you're getting on to, uh, it's about 28 or more years, so you have a lot of experience here. And then same for Director uh, Leon Guerrero. This has been uh, Humanities Councils and Grants has been your life for many, many years. And so there's that good guidance um, and, and knowledge of, of expectations on your end. So I, I think those qualities and that experience that you bring is really important for our community. And um, I, I know that you've talked to me before about, uh, again, walking people through the process if they need it um, and being a, approachable and uh, available for assistance that people shouldn't feel intimidated or, or worried necessarily because you are there to provide That's assistance. Good. And I think that means a whole lot to our community. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people have real potential, but maybe the grant writing or uh, following grants isn't their strong suit and they may not have a lot of experience in it. And so I think that attitude and ability by Kaha is just such a strength of the office and I appreciate that very much. And it's also good to hear about the, uh, the three processes. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier and you did as well, of course, that it can be to help walk them through the process or just make sure that things are appropriate. It's not just uh, something's missing and it gets kicked out the door. And so that's very, that's very helpful. I was wondering um, if if they're not found to be appropriate, but I guess there's there's nothing to hold somebody back from trying to re-examine their process to to make it fit within the expectations more so. Can people reapply? Is there a uh, waiting period before they can reapply? Um, no, we don't have we don't have a. Um... A waiting period. We we've actually had some applicants that have applied and then have um, have uh, have withdrawn and then actually have already reapplied. So okay. yeah, that did happen. Yeah. Okay. Good. And the more that people understand these processes, the more fun comfortable they'll feel, and uh, the more at ease they will be in applying. So that's all very good to hear. And it's very good that you're checking on the digital signature. Um, mm -hmm. You're right, there, there are these different standards. You maybe mm -hmm. heard that we just uh, passed a bill and then we'll see if the governor signs it into law, but there's also the executive order to develop digital uh, notary processes. Mm -hmm. So we're just all having to learn that uh, there are ways to safeguard this, mm -hmm. uh, but, but uh, that we can have some flexibility in our lives and and allow for a little bit more safety mm -hmm. if, if we, through technology and the proper safeguards in place, uh, we, we learn how to figure out these kind of measures. Okay, and then as you mentioned, it's a bit of a four-step process for the grant. So with that, is it a, a lump sum payment where 80 or 90% is given at the, the front and then when the final report is approved, they get the final amount. Um, how, does, how does that work since it is a multi-layered process? Well, we were actually thinking that it would just, because the amount is so, it's not great that we would just give it to them all up front because obviously they need it. And then we will just, uh, co you know, collect the, the, the uh, report at the end. And then if not, then they will have to be paid it basically. Right. And, and I mean, we're going through all these steps, including going through the AG's office for the, uh, yeah. yeah, the agreements and, and so forth. So there's, yeah, there, yeah. there are those processes uh, and weight to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think that uh, 
went through all the questions that I had. Uh, is there anything else you want to share before we move on? Um, no, I think I think we covered most of it. Well, maybe one thing is that, well, this just to say that this software, this is our initial uh, use of it, and we are. It's a learning process for everyone, but I think I can. I, I think it's pretty user friendly. And if I could ask Patty what you think about it as a board member and reviewer, that yeah, it's it's uh, it's great. Uh, it was very simple to use, uh, so um, it's quite an innovation. So I thank uh, Gillette and her team for coming up with this and getting it up so quickly. It's amazing, and and then to get the grant information out to. To the community, uh, they've done a really good job of you know picking up the phone and calling people and emailing people and trying to get the word out. Uh, but uh, from a board's perspective, to use that software has been it's great. It's a great invention, especially now. <laughs> yeah, and so are you saying that that software in particular helped you set this up on the website, the applications and. Uh, the ability to contact them through email and things like that was was that that's 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 the actual system that's the actual grant management system it's called submittable and it's just um we reviewed like several and there was one that we really liked but it was so much more expensive that we couldn't we couldn't uh, that could do all sorts of things and um could grow but this one uh turned out to be really good because it is very user friendly the other one was user friendly as well but um this one seems to work really fine. And it's just gonna take, um, of course, the staff are, are, are learning it, I'm learning it, the board is learning it, but uh, it's, it's gone relatively smoothly. Yeah, and they have a little tutorial that you can go through that was maybe five minutes on how to use it, and that was great. The other thing that's nice about it that I'll mention is that it's all a blind application. So when it comes to us, we have no idea who the person is or the organization. So we're just really, uh, scoring it based on the information that they're providing and not the person, so which is nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah, that's very good to hear. And so, um, with the software, it's something that the board can then use when they're in the third review and they can score right through the software right. system. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, a whole lot of government of Guam, and this is what we need to do when we talk about streamlining and, and all of these things. Really, so many offices are still uh, kind of paper and pencil, uh, Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheets and, and, and so forth. And it's not to say that Excel spreadsheets don't still have value. But if there's software that can move you from the application process to the review processes to the final review uh, and awarding, that sounds fantastic. And I, I really like that you said, you know, it's not just something that you have the staff do, um, but that you're having everybody, uh, yourself as director, all of the different staff, as well as the board members all learn. Mm -hmm. is, is this something that makes any sense to teach people in the public um, or, or is that not, it's not really for that? <laughs> no, it's not really for, no, not, not really for the public, but um, but the application process is simple. And in the beginning, some people had some problems because they weren't familiar with it. They didn't, you know, they said, oh no, there's some pr uh, problem with it, but it actually was user, <laughs> you know, user error that they didn't press a particular button. But there are lots of um, videos and how to, if you just search for it on, online, how, uh, how to do it, but the but it is very intuitive and um, user friendly. So uh, we haven't had, like I said, we have 19 applications and um, maybe just a couple of them, you know, had issues and it they all turned out to be user uh, errors, not 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 the actual program. So I'm really happy with it. And then in addition to all of that, taking it taking us all the way through from from the application to the review. At the end, there's also, it has a reporting function, which I haven't actually used, you know, uh, I mean, I've just sort of looked at it, but I haven't uh, actually uh, used that. So it's also sustainable because we don't have all this paper, you know, we don't have to use all this paper. And so the reports we can sort by different, you know, criteria. And um, so it'll be much easier. 
It keeps track of uh, funding as well as the financial aspect tells us how many grants have been approved, how much is, is there. Uh, and, and we can you know, ask for a report by village, by name, by you know, genre, whatever. Well, I love hearing all those things, actually. I mean, I love uh, different kinds of data and the different ways it can be sorted. And it's real tools that you can use. I mean, if you find out that all your artists are from two villages, well, you know that there are municipalities, I should say, then you know that there are 17 municipalities for some reason uh, that may have artists and people who produce humanitarian material who aren't availing of it. So it, it gives you ki all kinds of ways that you can use the, the data that's created to help you understand how to serve the community better. So I, I really like that. That sounds great. Yeah, uh, with it, does, does it have a backup storage on its own? Is this all in the cloud um, so that we don't have to worry about information being lost through a power outage or something yeah. like that? Yeah. It's cloud-based, it is cloud-based. That was one of the requirements that we had. And I really liked hearing that it was uh, green. Yeah, <laughs> and anything that can help us with reporting. Um, sometimes technology is really revolutionary in that way where uh, you can input data and then you can uh, provide the information of what type of reporting or outcome you need. And it can just be a fantastic thing that instead of the old paper and pencil sort of way of compiling it over two or three days, um, you can just sort the criteria uh, and, and apply it and then it can Mm -hmm. spit it out pretty quickly uh, in the report format that you need. Mm -hmm. So you're still going over that, but I do want to hear more about its potential because that is uh, for offices and efficiency and, and just keeping on top of things. Um, that's huge in efficiency. <laughs> um, and so uh, we all really like hearing that because we all want to make the offices as functional as possible, mm -hmm. as efficient as possible. And then you were saying that there were some additional benefits that uh, if people are spending less time kind of paper I, and pencil I'm, and Excel spreadsheets, um, we, what, can, what kind of benefits to the office do you think and the community come from that? Well, I think that first of all, uh, the amount of time that it would take to carry out a, a, a grant program uh, from beginning to end is, is you know, t involves a lot of menial tasks of, you know, photocopying and, and you know, uh, collecting documents. And I mean, it, it's very, uh, uh, consumes a lot of time. And so this process is much, is so much simpler. It's so uh, much faster. Uh, Jackie, can, can you just say something? Because you're, you've been involved with the grants. They take quite a, Quite a while, right? Quite a, quite a lot of time for the staff to go through everything. But I see the advantage of the program is, is everything is in, in one database that we can pull out whatever material we need. If we have to do a report to NEA, it's all there. Um, it's just so much easier and it'll, you know, it'll take up, uh, save the trees and take up less space in our filing cabinet. And, and it, you know, something... and oh. more time to maybe going out uh, when COVID's uh, all clear and to actually go out and maybe monitor the program itself, we can actually pay, you know, site visits and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, we, we hear about issues like that within different programs, uh, social workers having trouble getting out to as many uh, site visits as they need to and things like this. And so, you know, it, for, for, for their program, they need social workers too. But if, if we're streamlining the processes, they can be spending less time potentially with the mundane uh, paperwork and more time, as Jackie's saying, going out there and actually uh, monitoring the projects and providing assistance and having community outreach and all of those very important and good things uh, so that you're kind of maybe... Uh, for, for lack of real statistics, you know, 
um, doubling the capabilities of what the office is providing for, for the community. So that's, that's fantastic to hear. And one of the first things that went through mind is, you know, we all have, all these offices have uh, cabinet after cabinet after cabinet of files. Mm -hmm. And so from it being paperless from beginning to pretty much the end, because um, it didn't sound like there ever needed to be it printed out per se, then yeah, the, the storage capability in the cloud far exceeds what we have here in paper and then paper becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. You have to try to digitize it. You have to try to keep it from being termite eaten. You have to try and keep it from typhoons. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it's just a real problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that does real good things. And, and I also liked hearing about those tutorials. It's true. I, I uh, search engine all the time for tutorials for all kinds of everything. <laughs> and you can find it. It seems like there's so, pretty much nothing you can't ask for that somebody hasn't created a tutorial video for yeah. on YouTube. So uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share about the, the grant program? Oh, I did want to ask so that we understand these things. You know, software comes with different price tags. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for the judiciary and the, the hospital, they're dealing with multi-layered, very complex, very, uh, you know, complex uh, types of, of needs that are being met. And mm -hmm. so for those systems, we're talking about $20 million or $6 million. Um, so for a program like this, for some of our smaller governmental offices, mm -hmm. How much does a program like this cost? This one cost a um, little, little over $6,000. Did you say $6,000? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, over, wow. over, over. Yes, it's, it's okay. Yeah. No, I was expecting, I was expecting it to be much more than that just because of all of its abilities. <laughs> so yeah, the, the others, the others, we checked uh, three, three vendors and actually, uh, the others were in the range of 21, 28,000. This was by far the least expensive, but it, it, it worked. I mean, I liked the one that was kind of in the middle, but uh, uh, this one yeah, is well, fine. It's, you know, we're, we'll, we're all in make do mode right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. so this one, yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. But, but that's fantastic to hear and you know, um, I can't say what the range of costs are going to be per office, but but the fact that something that costs six thousand dollars can create the transformation and, and revolution that it has been for Kaha, mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm I'm just very pleased to hear that an investment like that can, again, for lack of real statistics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, make a 30% more e effective office or 50%. Um, before we go, if I could ask a few questions, because I know that there are other things that you've been working on. Mm -hmm. So I know it's been a lengthy process um, and it is something that the government needs to continue to work on, how to balance the accountability and the transparency of our, um, our processes for issuing RFPs and things like that um, to balance out that accountability and, and transparency with it not being too laborious. And I, I know that this process has been on going for a while. So I thank you for your persistence. Um, did you say that you might be moving into offices uh, shortly in the next maybe month or two? Yes, I hope so. I hope so. I haven't heard. Um, we uh, we had the bid out, and and uh, we re they received two bids, and uh, the lowest was the DNA, and so um, I'm just waiting for uh, the green light to know if if it's going to be final. I guess they have to do some review. Uh, the AG's office has had to do some um, a review of uh, because it was a certain amount of money over the next five years, I think. So uh, we're just, I'm waiting to get that uh, response and then I will know absolutely that we're actually going to be able to move into that. 
and, okay. and then there also has to be, um, I think they're, they're going to, to renovate it because it's, it's not acceptable right now. And so uh, I think they have 30 days after it's actually approved or signed to, to renovate it to our specifications. So we will have space there for a gallery. That was going to be my next question is because um, I, you know, I, I really was hoping that there would be a gallery. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're working our way towards being able to have access to physical locations uh, where we could experience a gallery again. But even so, I haven't, I haven't um, looked broadly, but I know that certain entities are having these virtual art shows and, and things like that. So um, we know that we're moving in a direction where both possibilities are, are potentially available then. Yeah, I actually had another reflection to my presentation about technology that I was gonna talk about that, but I understand if we don't have time, but um, uh, that's part of oh, our, no. the, are we going to be able to go on to that section or? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, let's let's go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Here we go. Oh, shoot. How do I? I forgot. I need to screen share again. Okay. Share. I need to. I, oops. Sorry. I have to go back in here. Okay. <laughs> So this is, um, I, I sort of wanted to go over, but I, I gave you a copy of our strategic plan. So maybe I yes. don't need to go over that, but I did want to uh, give you some information on uh, the arts, the artist survey that we did that was part of the strategic plan, just to show you that, um, you know, our, our constituency is, are the artists and the creatives and the humanities. So um, these are some of the responses, the questions, uh, just a select few. Uh, pertaining to technology. So this is, um, we had 63 responses and 47.6% have online portfolios. Okay. And then uh, when we asked what uh, professional development workshop forum or seminar topics were they interested in? 63% um, 63.9% were interested in grants and fundraising, how, how to raise money um, and then I think there was a question about social media. I just quickly, oh, and here are uh, examples of the online platforms that a lot of the artists follow. Facebook being the, the most 76.3% and then Instagram 61.0%, uh, and then YouTube. So you can see that our artists, not all of them, but um, a lot of them do use online. This is the one that really got me was, um, 95.3% uh, of the respondents said that they, they would be interested in joining uh, arts and humanities centric online platform. So this was factored into our strategic plan, um, as well as the strategic plan itself at the focus groups. This was the, the second most uh, requested um, item um, from across all eight focus groups was that we, they wanted us to enhance our technology, use of technology. So um, I was going to go over this, but since you've already seen it, I won't. <laughs> um, oh, no, please do, available. because, okay. because I, re I received it and I haven't gone through it very thoroughly, but um, the public always likes uh, understanding these things and, and getting oh, to know uh, them as well. Okay, so this is our, our strategic plan. Let me see, get it up here. Um, so, um, so our, our vision proposed vision to inspire creativity and expression. And our mission statement is uh, Kaha exists to encourage and promote the artistic practice of our artisans and create opportunities for Guam residents to learn, experience, express, and appreciate art and artistic talent in all its forms. And please note that this is a um, living document because after I read that, I realized that uh, we need to include the humanities and, and cultural it, you know, aspects in, in here as well, but um, uh, and the motto, I have to say that I have to give credit to Patty. She came up with this. We loved it. Is weaving arts and humanities into our daily lives. So yes, um, I, I'm a fan as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. 
So um, I'm just going to talk about this. Goal one is to build the capacity of Kaha and Guam's artistic community to advocate for, create, direct, oversee, and implement programs and activities that increase public awareness, interest, promotion, participation, and support for the arts and humanities. So that's a big, <laughs> a big charge. And then we came up with objectives for this, but I, um, I'll just talk about the one, uh, one C, although the first two were really immediate. One was to move into an office and gallery space by the end of the first quarter of this year, this fiscal year. And the second, the most requested um, uh, from the focus groups was construction, was really the creation of a permanent home, a permanent Kaha facility and space that is centrally located that can serve as the island's community hub for the arts and humanities. And um, <clears throat> across all of the, you know, all of the um, focus groups, this was the number one uh, request, a place that, you know, would, would serve not only uh, the artists and the cultural practitioners and the humanists, but um, tourists and residents as well. So um, this is, a, is, that's the first one. But the second one was technology was to upgrade Kaha's use of technology to streamline work processes and increase the reach of the council's programs and activities and provide opportunities to generate, generate income for Kaha and member artists by the end of uh, fiscal year 2021. And I'll just mention briefly, uh, we, we, I'll just mention the goals um, because I know that we've taken up a lot of time already. <laughs> Um, goal two is to build a vibrant arts and humanities community where arts, humanities, and culture are recognized as vital components of community life that are worthy of investment and support from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. So this goal, um, uh, the objectives for this are really uh, collaboration. Uh, the first one is, and we're already working on that, is to form partnerships and cross-sector alliances with uh, we named a few here, but basically with other organizations uh, so that we can facilitate cooperation and joint planning and sort of create win-win situations for, you know, other organizations that are, uh, uh, that we mesh with that, so we can bring uh, quality programs to the community. And I think I've taught, I've spoken with you about one with EPA, that, that uh, EPA, <laughs> and Kaha for the uh, art in the, the outdoor public spaces. Yes, that's, a, that's an area we haven't really developed too much. I mean, we have these wonderful murals and I, I have absolutely loved them. But um, yeah, we have potential to add more art in our public spaces, which uh, I think people will greatly appreciate. It adds a little bit of beauty or a little bit of thoughtfulness. Uh, you know, some, some types of art really create contemplation, <laughs> mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. And then goal three is to build community engagement to increase access to arts and humanities related opportunities, programming and activities for Guam's visitors and residents alike. And, and, and this is uh, sort of our outreach area where we wanna out, uh, out, uh, develop outreach programs for young artists, um, to develop uh, virtual classes and demonstration and exhibits for the general public and a resource center that contains, you know, information and the resource center can be online as well as uh, physical in our office. So that's, that's a really brief, if you want to, um, if the the audience uh, viewers want to uh, look at the strategic plan is, is posted on our website. So they can just go to the website and, and, and view it. Excellent. Um, yeah. So under the, um, I think, oh, actually, I think I made a, let me see. Oh, yes. So this, uh, to upgrade, this is uh, the objective for technology. Um, under goal one is to upgrade current website to include a crowdfunding platform, a section for artists uh, that includes resources for artists, grant funding opportunities, education and professional development, a community section to include a virtu the virtual art bank, which uh, we have a physical art bank now, 
uh, the artist directory, online exhibits, classes, and demonstrations, calendar of events, and an online store. So this is basically what's in progress now. Uh, so we've already, we've already re, uh, have the grant management platform in place. Uh, the website is currently being worked on right now. Uh, the community section is, uh, includes these uh, uh, areas, uh, resources for artists. So everything for grant opportunities to, you know, not only just locally, but um, to provide a place where they can go and find out what's the latest, you know, we can get information from NEA, you know, this can include information worldwide, you know, maybe residencies, all types of things for artists. Uh, the crowdfunding platform, which is a really big part of this, which is going to be a little, um, I think it's going to be a lot, it's a lot of work, but they're already working on it. Uh, and this will allow um, artists, actually, it'll allow creative types to, um, to go on to this platform and um, try to uh, solicit funding, you know, come up with a campaign, a fundraising campaign on online, similar to Kickstarter, I guess, or you know, the, some of those programs. Uh, so what we'll what we will be doing is we're going to have to uh, train them about how what it takes to um, to raise money on this platform because they use their uh, the artists themselves use their own network. And um, I was reading something recently where it says that 90%, I think, 90% of people that sign up for these types of things don't reach their goal, uh, mainly because they don't, they don't follow the directions. So um, this is going to have to be a, a big priority for us. But the good thing about this is Kaha can also use this uh, to raise funds for its programs and, and activities online. Uh, it'll be much easier. Um, the community section section will also oh shoot I got these mixed up <laughs> sorry community section the titles are uh, transposed I'm sorry <laughs> that's fine <laughs> <laughs> I okay um, so this actually is the artist section the, the first column uh, educational and professional development so all of these things that they'll will, the website will be a place where they can go. Uh, to have this. And then the community section is, we'll have the art bank. Um, and there was talk uh, of expanding the art bank. You know, we need to, to, to look at to beyond just uh, public buildings, but maybe even private uh, places where we can charge, you know, we, we have to learn, we have to start to raise income somehow of maybe making some of this art available to um, private businesses where it's publicly viewed uh, for a fee. Um, uh, the artist directory uh, is undergoing um, uh, a makeover, I guess you might say. Uh, online exhibits. This is what we were talking about. This is we have a section that will we will be able to have online exhibits um, from local artists, uh, classes and demonstrations by the artist to the community, and um, a calendar of events and an online store. And so the online store, we're looking at, instead of reinventing the wheel, maybe doing a collaboration with, um, for instance, Guampedia, uh, who already has the store, uh, but we will uh, collaborate with them so that, that we can use their store for our artists so that um, we bring traffic. So it's a win-win situation for, for all Right, of the us. traffic can go both ways then. Right, yeah. exactly, both ways. And and, uh, Guampedia, now this is many years ago, but I heard they got like 20,000 hits a month. So it's good exposure yeah. for all the artists. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, so that's what we're working on. So these things are already, um, the grant managed platform is done and the website uh, upgrade uh, containing all of these uh, aspects is currently being worked on. And we're, I hope to have it in mid-November, maybe. So I think that's, let me see, let me look at my notes. I think that's about um, it. Yeah. Well, and I just want to commend everybody again, because I know this takes a lot of uh, hard work. It takes a lot of uh, thinking together and working together and reaching out to the community and getting community involvement. Like you said, getting artists to take these surveys. So 
all of those things are so commendable because the goal here is to move everything forward. And I really like the way that uh, you're thinking beyond the traditional ways of how to make an agency sustainable, that you're thinking about ways that are serving the community, uh, serving the artists, but then also are perhaps revenue generating for your agency as well. And so I just really appreciate all that thoughtfulness and, and taking us to new levels of ways of thinking about the types of work that a, a government agency would do or services it would provide. Um, I think this is gonna do great things for our community and our artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I just would mention also, it, it may be information you know already, but um, when I've talked with the Office of Technology, there are ways that they can work with you to make your website uh, ADA compliant as well. And so mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know for CAHA, um, I think for a lot of government agencies and their websites um, that there's, you know, there's still a long way to go, but I, I do want to make you aware of it so that you're, you get to that point of being ADA compliant and then that just increases mm -hmm. the uh, service you provide artists and the service that you provide our community uh, in their ability to access everything that you guys are very thoughtfully putting together. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I don't think I have any more questions. Oh, just one comes to mind. So I know from the federal government and, and other programs, um, there are different types of relief. They're just still making its way through Congress and uh, the Senate and, and so forth. Have you heard, are, are there the possibilities of additional NEA monies that might be coming as assistance uh, no, I, to CAHA? I haven't, I haven't heard anything about that, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Maybe yeah, after well, it passes. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll definitely keep my ears mm -hmm. open because uh, anything, that, anything that we can bring back to our community uh, to help get through this time, but, but not only through this time, uh, some of what I've really appreciated in this thoughtfulness of the way that uh, everybody here from the staff to the director to the board has been real thoughtful this year in uh, putting things forward. I, I think, you know, the organization that you had with uh, these calls for grants, but having certain themes like um, yeah. making, if, if, I, if I remember it correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, some of it was to help artists get through this mm -hmm. pandemic. And maybe it was also to, to mm -hmm. make the way that they operate a little bit more COVID resistant. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that, but there were also themes about, I think, uh, social justice. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've had a lot of those issues mm -hmm. this year. Could you talk about the themes of your grants this year? Oh, yeah. That, um, well, the themes was, one was how, yeah, getting through, getting through this, this crisis. You know, uh, and we solicited, I actually, Jackie, do you know, did we get any, any applications for that? That grant line? I think you're muted. Jackie, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, no, there weren't too many uh, that came in through this uh, the FY 2021 uh, cycle. Uh, not too many that, that um, their projects or programs applied to the grant lines that we had indicated in, during the call out. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was thinking that maybe a lot of these uh, applicants had already developed their programs, knowing that the that, grant. Yeah, in anticipation of applying already, they probably had a project in mind. But mm -hmm. I, I think um, moving forward, because they know that uh, we're moving in that direction of having, you know, uh, themes with our, our grants, you know, um, we can go ahead and encourage them to think along that lines, maybe for next year, because mm -hmm. they were all uh, very good 
themes that you know will advance the agency, promote the arts, and and um, make everything um, eco friendly too. So, and and I have to say that our that our uh, uh, we will be using the grant management software um, for our next grant cycle. So uh, the whole process is going to be a little different than they're used to from for the for our regular grants. So we're going to uh, actually work towards trying to make the application a little simpler, but it'll also be online. Okay, in, in the past, uh, just to have that information out there, um, I know that there have been workshops to help people understand how to put a project together in a budget together, things like that. Is, is that something that CAHA still offers? Yeah, I think that we're what we're going to have to do also is to put those online. And I think it would be a good I idea, um, you know, to have a little uh, YouTube video or a podcast, whatever. I don't know what the correct terminology is, but a video uh, where we do that. We can also, once we get back to some semblance of normalcy, we can also have um, um, uh, workshops at the at the office as as well. But I think that it would be good to have both, have um, an online one, and then for those that maybe need more help or like the personal touch can come to the office. But yeah, I think that's an important aspect of this because we're also go trying to reach out to the underserved areas because you know, with art, you can find, um, you know, some of the most brilliant artists come from poverty or from, you know, uh, and so we really want to be able to, you know, to reach out to uh, the underserved community. So we also were looking at uh, maybe even having a smaller um, uh, limited grant uh, with uh, less restrictions um, for, uh, you know, for, uh, I guess you'd call them entry level artists or to encourage and, and provide them with an opportunity to, to, to progress. So um, that's another yeah. area that we're really looking at. And uh, the, the problem is that our grants are 50% federal. And so the federal grants have a lot of requirements. So hopefully if we can build up enough, you know, revenue, we could actually have maybe a not a, a grant that doesn't have any federal uh, funding that can have be a little uh, simpler and, you know, not so many restrictions so that we can get applications from from a different segment of the community. Right, I really I really like that um, with this sort of entry level um, artists. I mean, for me, I enjoy all kinds of art, whether it's street art, um, yeah, all all those levels, because there are powerful messages, or um, it. it it just is something that can transform somebody's life if they, if they feel like they have found their calling and they have a way of expressing themselves in a way that others appreciate. And uh, for some of them, it's just giving them that opportunity and providing them those tools so that they could make a business out of it or just continue to progress as an artist uh, for self-expression, things like that. So. I really like that we're thinking of these different levels in our community. Um, I remember, uh, what was it? Uh, maybe it was just in those discussions with uh, one of your board members, Joey Certeza, when we had a conversation together. But you know, people being real interested in having that connection between the youth and, and the art world, if you will. We all loved art probably when we were in school, but to have some communication or connections with artists and, and um, these other levels of, of art could really uh, speak to a lot of them and, and um, encourage them to develop this side of themselves. Yeah. Okay, well, I think this has been a very enlightening. I've enjoyed it very much. I think that those listening in 
will get a lot out of this and I will continue to share it because it's also almost a tutorial, if you will. You're getting to explain the online application process and how you're here to offer assistance. So I'm gonna continue sharing it in that way. And you know, one of the things that I've, I've found is that uh, with, with some of these sorts of online conversations or public hearings is people might listen to them as they're driving around, almost like a podcast, like you were saying. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, uh, people might be interested in, in uh, watching it or maybe even just uh, listening to it to, to hear about the process a little bit and the ways that Kaha is continuing to grow itself mm -hmm. for our community. Mm -hmm. So with that, is there anything else anybody would like to share before I close us out? I just All like right. to thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely, uh, uh, I'm I'm very pleased that uh, we've all gotten to hear this. Uh, I think the more that we hear from all of our agencies and understand the ways that they're working for us, uh, the better, you know, the better uh, we understand what's going on. But uh, maybe also the more confidence we have in what's going on as well. Sometimes when Good things are happening perhaps behind closed doors. Um, we just feel like we don't understand or we're not sure what's going on. And this way, it's a, it's a way to bring the community along with us. Right. So I like that. So as a public reminder, uh, the community will continue to receive any written comments about today's virtual public hearing that will be made a part of the committee report. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatnya Revitalization, and Self-Determination and Regional Affairs, and submit it via email to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or to my office located on the second floor of the Guam Congress building. The committee will now adjourn this virtual public hearing on bill number four, oops, oh, this was uh, somehow a, a bill number snuck in here, so we'll, we'll skip the bill part. <laughs> but the committee will now adjourn this, pub, uh, this virtual public hearing. And Mr. Um, Maasi, for your attendance and participation, the time is now 341. So have a good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much to everybody for coming yeah. in and sharing a lot of what's going on with Kaha. All right, thank you. Thank you.